Morning, everybody. Welcome to the parallel sessions. Next speaker is uh, David Van Hoek, talking about time. And uh, well, time, I guess everybody has a time. Well, you, people used to have watches or smartphones or, well, anyway. But with, with security, uh, I've seen in the past many, many issues when, when timing was not synchronized and you were hacked and you were, well, you have the logs, but you can't when you upload them and the security team, they can't find out the correlation bureau because the time was wrong. Or what happens nowadays when I, on my own machine, uh, run virtual machines, I start them up, I, I test stuff, and then I run into troubles and then I find out there's a time synchronization problem with the, VP, with the VM that started. So, uh, well, time, it's important, uh, it should be right, and uh, I love to hear David's talk. Thank you, David. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, so, I'm David, I'm a technical lead for Statime and NTPDRS, which are implementations of a PTP client and an NTP client, respectively. If you don't know those words yet, don't worry, by the end of the talk you will understand that. Uh, I have a background in physics and mathematics, and in a past life I also did some uh, work on uh, cryptography, uh, particularly around UV for those who know that. And uh, right now, I'm also an active participant in the IETF, in the Time Working Group, where we're trying to work towards the next uh, generation of NTP. If you're a user of Time and you have opinions, uh, please talk to me. We are always interested in end-user opinions. We have way too little of those. Uh, so, what I'm going to talk about. Why is Time important? I want to convince you that it's important to think about how your computers get time, um, where that time comes from, uh, how precise it is, and that you need to make decisions on this for various reasons. Um, then I want to go a little bit into the detail of how do we actually synchronize clocks. So how does it work? Uh, what options do we have? And then I'm uh, mostly a software guy, so I'm going to mostly s focus on sort of the software solutions, the network solutions to time synchronization, which are NTP and P2P. Uh, I'll say a little bit about the other ways you can get time, uh, but I won't go deep into those. Okay, so why is good time important? For one, it's usually quite critical for security. If you use certificates on the web, when is that certificate valid? Well, it has a issued at date. It's not valid before that date. It usually isn't much of a problem with the issued at date because it should be in the past, pretty much always when you see a certificate. But the other one that really is important is the expiry date. Um, so certificates expire because we are uh, occasionally losing keys. That just happens. So it's nice that if it's after a certain date, that key is no longer valid, it's no longer trusted, everyone's happy. But what if you don't know the date? Now you're going to trust that certificate that I lost my key to. Great. Now everybody can uh, impersonate me. Um, revocation is not a complete solution for this. So OCSP, for those who know that, if you do that interactively, um, it will work. Mostly it still uses some certificates that need time again, so you're not entirely out of the woods. But if you use stapling or if you use certificate revocation lists, those have timestamps on them when they are valid. That might not be uh, the current time, so if you're not sure about the time, you can't validate those. So for this, you're going to need time. Um, one of the ways you can exploit this is if I can uh, influence your clocks, I could just set your clock black to before Heartbleed happened. Everybody remember Heartbleed? Yeah, that gave us a bunch of private keys for certificates. <laughs> so that's going to be a lot of fun if I can do that. So this is one of the reasons. This doesn't require really precise time. Plus minus 10 seconds is going to be fine. Even if your plus minus an hour, it's typically not going to be a large issue. Um, so this is mostly for security. We don't care about precision. We care about it should be correct. Next, we might want good time for our events logs. So in what order did things go wrong? Suppose I have a power grid, a very simplified power grid here, and this power plant and these two, trans uh, these three transmission links all went down at the same, around the same time. What happened? I don't know. If this one went down first, it might just have been a cascading overload. Uh, 
But if the power plant uh, went down first, it might have been some sort of pulse that it produced that took down the lines with it. So there's completely different failure scenarios that you can distinguish based on which order did things happen in. If you don't know precise ti enough time for that, you're gonna be in trouble if you're trying to figure this out. This is usually requiring a little bit more precision. Depends very much on the type of system you're observing. In a power grid, they might care about orders of microseconds for this. Um, if you have a distributed computer system, depending on the communication delays, you might be fine with milliseconds here. You might need nanoseconds here. It depends a lot on what the distances between your computers are, how obvious it's gonna be that two things were in a certain order. Um, but finally, we might also want it just for performance in our distributed systems. So time synchronization can be used in uh, things like uh, linearization. So suppose I want to, ha I have a uh, storage system and I want to make it look like the out to the outside world, like it's one machine that just takes in requests, stores things, and then when you ask it later, it'll always say correctly that it has the data or it doesn't have it, but I, in the back end, have multiple machines that are handling these requests. One of the very simplified ways I could do uh, this in practice is I could store it to machine A and to machine B, and these machines know that they'll have the latest copy of the data within the time amount x. So if there comes in a read request at a time, uh, at a time y, I can just wait for time amount x to make sure that there's not gonna be any more writes for that read time, and then give my result back. There's one detail with that. If my clock has an uncertainty, I need to compensate for the fact that I also don't precisely know the time, so that introduces an additional delay that I need here. So if I have more precise time, I can shorten those delays, my system becomes more performant. This is a very simplified example. Um, more complicated examples of this are actually used in the real world. For example, Facebook uses variations on this in their multi-master database setups that they use internally. It's one of the reasons why Facebook uh, has invested quite <coughs> heavily in rolling out P2P to all its data centers because the extra uh, time precision that they get, it just translates to extra performance for them. So these are all reasons why you might want good time. They all have put slightly different requirements on it. So for security, we really care about um, that our time is correct and that it comes from a trusted source and can't be manipulated that easily. For things like event logs, sort of similar, but we also start to care a lot about how precise are things. And depending on the situation we're in and the type of things we want to log and where that stuff comes from, we might be willing to compromise a little bit on our security over time if it means that we can get more precise time and more reliably precise time. And the same for uh, if you do this for performance, maybe we are in a fairly trusted environment so we can take a bit more lenience on security, but trade that for very much higher precision. So how do we synchronize the clocks? So the basic idea that's behind any scheme for synchronizing clocks is this diagram. So we've got our clock that we want to synchronize and we've got some reference somewhere. And we can do sort of two things. We can send a message from the clock to the reference and we timestamp when we send it, and then the reference timestamps for us when it receives it, and then via some channel, not drawn in the diagram here, we return those two timestamps. That gives us sort of one leg. There's one problem with that. If we only have that one leg, there's a transmission delay between the clock that we want to synchronize and a reference. So we need to somehow correct for that transmission delay. One of the ways we can do that is we can, <laughs> we can, also send a message back from the reference to the clock that we want to synchronize. Again, timestamp when we send it, when we receive it. And if we make the assumption that this situation is symmetrical, so it takes the same amount of time going one way as it takes going back, we can use the average of T2 and T3 and the average of T1 and T4, and we know those should have happened, those timestamps correspond to the same physical time, real time. Assuming there's no relativity uh, and all that, relativity is usually ignored in these kinds of problems. Uh, 
So that's one way that you can do synchronization. And this is pretty much the basics for how our networks, uh, network-based synchronization stuff works. So P2P and NTP, they basically, they do this ping pong situation. They send around packets, measure when they are sent and when they're arrived. And then we do some math to get how far the clock is away from the reference and we can use that to adjust. Question. So, a ref so the question is, what would normally be a reference? A reference can be all sorts of things. It could be uh, a machine that you have in your server room that is uh, that you decide is the what you want to use as your ground truth for time. If you don't care about the outside world, that that is completely valid. It could be a GPS satellite in orbit. Um, it can't use the ping pong here. Um, it could be. Uh, a, gram, uh, a clock at one of the national laboratories. So in the Netherlands, we have ASL. They have a number of atomic clocks that they use uh, that are part of UTC. And they uh, have a time server attached to that that you can use to get UTC as your time reference. So there's, there, there's a whole load of options here. Um, so I'm, there's one slight... Um, Difference if you start looking at things like GNSS, which are valid time sources for a lot of people. There, we don't really do the first leg, so we don't send anything to the satellite. That, that would get way too complicated. So we just receive messages. Then we need to somehow figure out what the transmission delay was. In the case of, uh, GNS, uh, of GPS or GLONASS or things like that, the easy solution is to not just take one of these satellites, but take multiple. We know the exact locations of all these. That allows us to calculate our position. And that allows, because we then know the distance, we can use the distance to calculate the transmission delay and compensate for it that way. Similarly, if you use, for example, radio sources, uh, DCF-77 is still a thing. Um, you can do something similar. You know the distance from here to, in Germany, where the mast is and you can use that to, com uh, to calculate uh, and compensate for the transmission delays. So what options do we basically have? Well, over computer networks, uh, we have NTP uh, and PTP, which I'll dive into a little bit more detail later. Um, and then other channels that you commonly see used uh, are GNSS, so GPS, Galileo, Baidu, GLONASS, the, the main satellite constellations uh, that are in use for this, or even AM radio. This is a very old technique, uh, but still in active use. Uh, multiple countries still maintain transmitters, a lot more than what I've uh, got on the sheet here. Um, and they basically, they send out a radio signal with a specific frequency um, with a time signal in there. Okay, so let's dive into, first of all, NTP. What is it? So NTP is basically a client-server architecture. So we have a source of time, or multiple sources of time in the network. And uh, they act as servers. And then we have our client, our computer is a client, for example. And it can connect to the, those servers, ask them, hey, how late is it for you? And it responds back with, uh, oh, you asked that at time uh, I received your question at time X. I sent my response at time Y. Um, good luck. That's basically how it works. It works over the internet really nice. You can use multiple sources. So what typically happens is you get a sort of hierarchical system. There are some servers on the internet that have direct access to time through either GPS or through being connected to a physics laboratory, so VSL, for example. And then there are servers on the internet that provide time to other people but themselves don't have an authoritative source of time directly, but they just ask other uh, NTP servers again. We call those Stratum 2 servers, uh, or even Stratum 3, if they only use Stratum 2 servers as their source again. Um, and then we have a ver wide variety of clients at the bottom. So things like laptops uh, typically use NTP, desktops, uh, mobile phones these days often use NTP uh, for their time synchronization. Uh, but also things like routers, uh, stuff like that. So a lot can use this. Um, there is an authenticity layer for this. It's called NTS. And it allows you the server to basically sign 
effectively sign its uh, responses to the client so that the client knows for certain that it came from the server and uh, then if you trust the server, you can bound your error by basically how long this round trip uh, is taking. So if it takes you 10 milliseconds uh, to get a response from the ser uh, server, you know that whatever time you're gonna get out of this whole calculation mess is gonna be within 10 milliseconds of what the server tel told you the time actually should be. Um, normally the accuracy is a little bit better than uh, round trip times if nobody's messing with you and you can get to within five milliseconds over the internet is fairly standard uh, and to within, I've seen it as, as good as one microsecond but typical is somewhere 10 to 100 microseconds if you're just running this in a local network. Question. So the question is, uh, if the server has to sign its time, uh, wouldn't that affect things? The answer is yes, it will affect things, and it will effectively make your the server's transmit timestamp typically a little bit less precise. There's a few ways around that. Uh, the, the, the straightforward way is just ignore it. Um, turns out that in practice this is a fairly predictable delay, so you can to a degree <coughs> Uh, correct for it. The other way is that we sign the message that we are sending out as sort of the measurement message and then afterwards the client comes back to us as a server. This requires keeping a bit of state so not every server supports it. But afterwards it comes back and it asks, well when did you really send that packet? And then it can give you a pr more precise timestamp and because that I I is then sent at a later time you can get extra precision that way. So that's sort of the two ways that you can solve this. Um, so that's basically the outline of NTP. Um, NTS is one of the big reasons to use an NTP. It's, it gives you an option to get secure authenticated time, which if, you want, if you're trying to solve the security question, that's a really valuable thing. And there's very little on the internet or uh, outside of the internet that can give you this. Things like <coughs> GPS or uh, the AIM radio stuff. The AIM radio stuff is a bit harder, um, but they can be spoofed. They can be uh, interfered with fairly easily. Um, so th this is the big way to get secure time as well. Um, so when do you use this? Well, if you... It's, it's pretty much the default on most modern operating systems. So there's a detail in that. Usually they don't enable this authentication layer. That's important to keep in mind. If you're running this in just with a default setup, you might be running a reasonably insecure setup. If you're using the system de time sync daemon, you might be running a very insecure setup. And I might be able to take over the time in your computer within seconds of you connecting to any network that I can spoof IP addresses in. That's a bit scary. Um, I want you to be a bit scared on that front um, because we need to think about these sort of things, especially if you're running servers in this world. Please, please, please do think, where do I get my time from? Is that secure? Because these sort of things can break you up. Uh, it's useful for things like uh, time for verifying certificates. It's typically precise enough that the server logs of any server that you're gonna be running in practice are gonna be close enough to reality that you're not gonna care about any residual time errors. It is, for the most part, simple to set up. If you want to set up an NTS time server, so not a client, the clients are very easy. If you uh, want to set up uh, an NTS server, it can be a bit harder, uh, and particularly for NTS as well, not all clients support it yet. Um, please, please, please push your vendors to support this if you have the influence for that. Um, if you want examples for how to use this and don't have software yet uh, that you're committed to, I work on NTP DRS, which is an implementation of all this. We have nice documentation for all this. There's links at the end. Um, one of the challenges, though, with NTP is uh, NTS bootstrapping. So NTS, we use authenticated time. Uh, 
How do we start our authenticated session? Well, we use TLS. We use TLS with certificates. Oh, we're gonna need time again, aren't we? So, um, we need to check the validity of those certificates, and for that we need to go in time. Well, we've just created a circle. Um, so, how are we gonna fix this? Well, there's two options. One, we just ignore this, uh, this whole problem, and we just assume that our system time is good enough at the start that we're gonna be able to validate these certificates. That may sound a bit weird, but for most uh, desktop or laptop systems, this is actually perfectly fine to do. They have backup clocks that keep running continuously. They're not extremely precise. They might be off by a few seconds in a year, but they're gonna be precise enough that it's fine. It's not gonna cause you to do that, that certificate validation wrong. The other way to do this, and this is the slightly more scary way, is that you're gonna do special handling of all your certificate uh, validity checks. So I get a certificate, I check that it's signed properly, but I'm gonna ignore the issued at and um, expiry dates for now, and I do that with all the chain. I just keep track of those dates, that I do have a record of them somewhere, and then at the end of the process, when I start to get my first timestamps, I'm gonna check that those timestamps are consistent with everything that uh, I needed to validate in the meantime. So that the certificates I just was asked to trust, uh, that they were actually valid at the time that the server is trying to convince me it is. If you do this, it's not entirely watertight. Uh, there are still scenarios where you can get tricked into accepting uh, certificates that are old but somebody's gonna need quite a few keys in that process to uh, convince you of that. So the end, the end result is this is not entirely fixable. Uh, you're gonna need a root of trust somewhere, um, but this will make it sort of harder for someone uh, to attack you. So those are basically the two answers there. Um, finally, uh, NTP does have some disadvantages, so one of the things it doesn't do, it does not correct for random delays and routers. This might sound like negligible. Um, it actually, this is one of your main sources of noise if you use NTP. So this is what causes those 10 to 100 microseconds, or over the internet, even milliseconds of uh, variation in your measurements. And as a consequence, it results in error in your clock. And secondly, over the open internet, this is the really big one, is there is no guarantee that the way you go to the server initially and get the time is the same way as it sends it back to you. So that symmetry assumption we had at the beginning might not hold. In fact, on the internet, it usually doesn't. And this is actually the main factor why over the internet you get only a, up to about five milliseconds. I've done tests at home, I've seen Statistically, uh, with the amount of variation in the measurements that I see, I can get to within 100 or 200 microseconds of both VSL, the um, Swedish National Standards Laboratory, and the German National Standards Laboratory. And if I do that at the same time, I can just measure all those things. Then I still see differences of about a few milliseconds between all three of them. Those differences are not because their clocks are wrong. Those differences are because my path to, especially the Swedish people, and the path back from the Swedish people back to me are not the same. So that's a shame. Um, and that brings us nicely to P2P. It is completely different. It's basically, it's a broadcast model. It's just a server that tells the network, this is the current time. It's basically built to solve a lot of these disadvantages of NTP. So, we have a single source of time. There's no longer any way we can use multiple sources of time. This is a disadvantage because it um, doesn't allow you to basically filter out a server that's lying about its time or is completely gone off the deep end uh, and has a wrong timestamp. Uh, th there's no way to filter that out anymore. Well, not if you use it in a standard way. Um, however, we get a lot back. So the server still broadcasts the time. We can send requests back uh, to the server from, uh, to request what the delay is. So essentially this back edge is still there. So it's not completely broadcast. There is two-way communication there. Um, and we have a single source of time. But then because we organize this and we get some 
and uh, nice things as well with network hardware that can support PTP, we can get far, far higher precision. So uh, 10 nanoseconds is fairly normal if, you, if all the hardware in your system uh, supports it. And uh, if you do uh, use things like White Rabbit, uh, or if what is these days the P2P high precision uh, profile, you can even get to within hundreds or even tens of picoseconds uh, over reasonably standard network technology. So how does it work? Well, we have one master clock, and then every switch in our network is what we call a transparent clock. I'll go into a little bit more detail later. And then underneath that, we either have boundary clocks, which are sort of the, the sub-servers in the P2P world. They just transfer time through them, synchronize themselves, and, and basically reset the whole connection logic. And then we have ordinary clocks that listen to the servers, uh, to the master clock, and get the time that way. And the master typically sends out its time once a second uh, or so, and you typically work request a delay on the order of once every two, one, one to two seconds. It depends a bit on the network setup and what, what works for your situation and what provides you with the correct precision. Um, so where is this typically used? Large-scale distributed systems. I uh, talked about Facebook uh, earlier. High-frequency traders also tend to use this. Um, they focus a bit more on the uh, precision because uh, Regulation requires them to have timestamps from clocks that are accurate to microseconds. Um, it's also used in synchronization measurement systems. You had a question. Yeah, so, oh, I forgot, forgot to mention that. So what, in, in P2P, one of the big differences is indeed what you say is each of these transparent clocks, as we call them, or switches uh, <coughs> typically is, is what is a transparent clock. If it sees a P2P message come in, it timestamps it itself internally. And once it sends it back out, it timestamps it again, and it calculates how long did I keep this message internally. And it tells, it, it tells the outside world about the fact that it kept this message for a little bit of time by adding, uh, by telling, basically modifying the packet a little bit and adding some time to what we call the correction. And this correction can then be used by the clients to compensate for the fact that the switch might one time keep the packet for one millisecond and the next time it might keep it for 1.2 milliseconds. Um, question. Yeah, yeah. so basically that's how it can compensate for the jitter because of the non-fixed processing time. Um, so that's, this is where this is used. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. It can run on a lot of transport layers. Uh, so it has specifications for um, device net. It got, uh, it, you can run it directly on Ethernet, uh, layer two. You can run it on IPv4, you can run it on IPv6. Um, in, in those latter two cases, it uses broadcast addresses. Um, once you got to places where th uh, broadcasting is not forwarded anymore, it'll peter out, of course. And typically, firewalls will keep it in uh, local to the network. Um, but that's basically how it works. Because of the symmetry stuff, um, the fact that it uses broadcast it means it, that it does that both ways. So if a client asks for what is, hey, uh, server, hey uh, master clock, what is my delay to you, uh, that's basically also broadcast over the entire network because that guarantees, uh, gives you some more guarantees about symmetry. Uh, so that, that, that is something to keep in mind. Uh, you can run P2P over what we call unicast connections. It's complicated. It basically comes down to you're then cr sort of creating a effectively a, li a little VPN just between those two computers in a sense. Um, that, that's how the spec specifies that you should do it, essentially. <coughs> 
Typically, yes. Um, I'm sure there have been people who've tried to do this over the internet. Uh, I'm sure you can if you deviate from the standard enough. Um, most of the advantages, though, you're not going to get over the internet because you need all this device support. Um, which brings us nicely to our disadvantages. Well, P2P is quite a bit more complicated to set up. Um, you've got all these hardware requirements. And you need to tell everything in the system that it needs to do stuff with P2P, what P2P system to use. Um, turns out that it takes a bit more, bit more finessing to set up. You need support in all your hardware. So routers, any routers, any switches in the network that you want time to carry through precisely, they're going to need P2P support. Uh, depending on your vendor, this might not be cheap. Um, you need special network cards because if you want to reach actually reach these precisions, um, you're going to need network cards that are going to tell you how late the message come in. Uh, so they're going to need support for timestamping. And security is hard in the P2P world. It's not non-existent. There are extensions that allow you to do things with encryption. Um, but the fact that you want this high precision, um, we get back to the question that was asked in the back uh, a few minutes ago. The fact that you want this high precision, really it starts to matter uh, when you start doing um, when you start doing these signing operations, especially, this, this especially becomes a problem in the switches, essentially, because they're going to need to modify your packets to some degree. And we can sign them, but then they need also the keys to modify that signature, thus breaking some of your security guarantees, because there's multiple people now having the same signing key. Or if you, they don't modify the signature, then we're going to need to ignore that correction. So we're getting security guarantees, but we're not getting security guarantees on that correction, which makes things harder. Um, in practice, if you need security, I would advise going ag against uh, going with P2P. <laughs> P2P is primarily useful if you own the network, if you trust the network. Um, and there's a second reason for that, and that is the way P2P does the time exchange is a little bit more complex than with NTP. And in practice, it makes it a little bit harder to really fine tune your time synchronization. So if you're not having all these hardware advantages, uh, like hardware timestamping and things like that, it would actually end up being slightly less precise than NTP. NTP, because it's the simplicity of NTP allows you to do a few things in your processing <coughs> that make it slightly easier to reach the limits of precision with your hardware, essentially. Question. Uh, yeah, there are ways to do this, essentially. Um, right now, they're not fully standardized. So one of the ITF standards that's currently in development is something called NTP <coughs> over P2P, which is essentially we do the basic idea of NTP, um, but we hide it as uh, P2P messages to trick all the hardware in the network uh, to treat it like it's P2P which allows us access to the correction fields um, and allows us to get hardware that supports timestamping, but only for P2P packages, to get it to actually timestamp our packets. And then you get some of the advantages of P2P with NTP. Um, it's in the process of being standardized. It's an open question at this point how long it's going to be useful for me. Well, well, we'll see, essentially, how that's going to run. Yes? Um, what I have from this is that the whole process in the house that does have a time control to a very large setup that mm -hmm. is basically one network possibly can be used in. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so where do you get the time from from the NTF? So that... That's, again, a choice. So it depends a bit on what your targets are with your system. Uh, it can be that you just designate a server as, I want everything synchronized to whatever that server thinks the time is. You're basically just creating a local synchronization network. This is primarily useful if 
what you care about is not so much what is the current time, but more the time on that computer and the time on that computer better agree really well because that is going to give me either with logs uh, an advantage or uh, with distributed system as an advantage. Uh, an alternative option that's really common uh, is that to just use GPS. So people then just have a GPS receiver on the roof. This is what Facebook uh, does, by the way. They use that to get time to about one nanosecond. Uh, with GPS, that's typically doable. If you have a stationary receiver and you filter it enough, you can get to about one nanosecond if you have a precise enough local clock. And then you use that as your local reference source. Um, and this, this is more the, the, the you're still in the real world. Uh, you, you still want a relation to UTC. So the, the, uh, if, if you start looking at these really precise stuff, the, the, the 100 picoseconds or better, that are used typically for measurements in laboratories, they usually don't care that much about an absolute time scale, but they do care about local stuff. So uh, you typically just want, if, if these two measure things, I really want that to be at the same time. So that's, um, well, that depends a bit. So one of the things with clocks and time synchronization is that I've not gone too deep into it here. It's, it's basically a bit of a different talk. We could be talking for hours about the whole subject of how do we actually do this fine tuning of synchronization. But one of the things is that there is usually a trade off between how well can I synchronize with my upstream? How precisely uh, do I have control over the noise in, in the synchronization channel? And how precise is my local clock? If I make my local clock really precise, I can deal with more noise and bad stuff on the network and vice versa. So if, if your goal is to get good local time, atomic clocks may be really useful if it means that you can just get that over the public internet from an external source. Um, or they might be completely useless if you already have a good fiber connection back to you, to v VSL, for example, and, and can just really often do the synchronization very precisely, and you can compensate for the fact that a quartz crystal drifts a bit. So that that's the trade-offs that you have there. Um, that changes, of course, if you want to become part of the time standard. So UTC. I'm not sure if anybody's aware here how UTC works, but basically we have a lot of laboratories all around the world. They all have clocks. Those clocks all take at their own rate, and they continuously measure between all, the, all of them uh, what, the what they all think the current time is. And then all those measurements are recorded. They're sent once a month to Paris, where the International Bureau of, Bureau of Measures, I think, these days, uh, does a lot of statistics on that based on how good everyone's clocks are uh, and that basically then they decide well UTC was this and this clock was this much of uh, UTC during the month and this clock was this much of. So UTC is sort of a virtual time scale. Uh, it doesn't really exist as a physical thing but we've got all these clocks around the world that are synchronized to that. If you want to be a part of that then yeah of course Atomic clocks are the basics. You might even want to build uh, uh, fountain-based clocks. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff you can do there that, uh, if you really want to go into that. OK, so that covers basically most of the material I wanted to talk about. Um, so some final calls to actions. Um, go think about what, how you use time in your own systems. Are your current setups? Uh, sufficient for that, uh, are there things you could pr improve? Don't be caught out by this by the moment you get into trouble uh, the first time. Um, if you are interested in actual implementations of NTP or P2P, uh, NTP DRS is, an, we hope, fairly accessible implementation of NTP. We've done our best to write really accessible documentation uh, to get you started fairly quickly. Start time, the same. We have invested somewhat in documentation. It's not to the level of NTP DRS uh, yet, but if you're interested in P2P and want to play around with, it's an, it's at least easier than P2P for Linux. Um, for those of you who've worked with that, that will hopefully, uh, you'll know that doesn't say much, but uh, we at least offer an introductory guide. Um, 
And if you want to contribute in any way, we need feedback. The standards process, we're working on NTP v5. One of the things, it's really useful for us to have requirements from people that run servers, that people that do things with time. Um, there's a draft, um, I've got a link in the final slide. Please f give feedback on it if you agree with the sort of requirements picture we've stated out there. The same holds for software. If you have, uh, if you've tried it and you've got comments on our documentation or you're missing features or things like that, please tell us. It's always nice to have more information. Are there any more final questions? We still have some time, so. Um, so what uh, some of the advantages I would say is that we've with NTPDRS we've really focused on making a secure so solution. So Crony is still written in C. That means that they're all the, Miroslav is doing a really good job. Um, don't get me wrong, but there's still some. You have a slightly increased risk of memory safety issues, um, which tend to be sort of the worst security bugs because that's how you get remote code execution typically. Um, we have slightly more intuitive uh, configuration interfaces. Um, so both Crony and the reference implementation of NTP as well as NTPSEC, they all tend to use a sort of command structured configuration file, which means that you can later in your configuration file override what you did earlier. That can make it sort of hard to see and, and audit uh, what is going on in the configuration. We've explicitly made a few choices there that, that make it sort of really obvious you can't say things only once, and then that is going to be what, what is present in your running uh, setup. So th then that's basically the advantages at this time. Um, we're also, at this time, slightly better than uh, Crony in, in terms of synchronization precision, but honestly, that's not enough to warrant a switch. If you were to ask me, NTS support? NTS support is available on both. So uh, that, that's apples and oranges. Yeah, that, 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 that is not really a reason to choose one over the other. I saw a question over there somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> with the same path, you've got more chances, but yes, uh, even if you have the same path, there still can be residual asymmetries. You can deal with those. They, they tend to show up as sort of systematic offsets, uh, even, in the, even if in the asymmetric path situation, you, you can deal with those. You can cor correct, essentially. You can measure them once with something like uh, GPS and then put them in as a fixed correction in your system, or you can do that once a year to adjust the correction should anything change. Um, load specific. My experience with higher loaded paths is that it also shows up in the jitter. So you, you, you start to see that when, packet, when, a, when one of the to routes is more loaded, it also tends to introduce more of the jitter. And actually, that is something you can still statistically uh, correct for. It's not something we do currently in NTPD RS. It's uh, usually, it's a small advantage, and it's quite complicated statistics to implement, but the, 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 the asymmetric loading is typically less of a problem. That's going to be the final question, by the way. <laughs> so with NTPDRS at the moment, uh, we t take the approach of the clock will be roughly right. Um, <coughs> And as for where our roots of trust come from, 
By default, we get those from the operating systems uh, root stores. Um, it sort of makes the most sense to get them from there. You can add additional ones at the moment. We don't support full override at the system store yet. If there's need for that, if somebody has a real use case for that, uh, please contact us. It's not that hard to implement for us, but we just currently don't have it. Okay, I think that's about it. <laughs> uh, do we have time for one short one? Yeah, one ah, sure. <laughs> Um, so that depends a lot on what you want out of your experiments. If you just want to toy around with it a little bit, the, the easiest and cheapest way is to get two Intel i210 network cards. They support uh, time stamping. You put them in separate computers, use one of them as your time source and one of them as your time sync, and you've got basically a very simple uh, test setup that supports uh, P2P, uh, that can support P2P and, and the high precision. If you want to go beyond that, it might be wise. Th th there's companies that basically sell specialized boxes that can function as a, a grandmaster clock. Um, that's typically the next step. Uh, that, that gets reasonably expensive fairly quickly. About so the network cards you can get for under 100 euros a piece. Um, the the grandmaster clocks typically go for. 1,000, 1,500 euros, the simple ones. And you can make them as expensive as you want because uh, they serve corporations. <laughs> okay. Thanks for your interesting presentation about time, uh, David, and a Thank small you. presence. Yeah. Thank you very much.